The word home is an important word. It's usually used to describe the place we live in, like our house or apartment, but it has a much broader meaning. Outside of your actual dwelling, it can be the place you're most comfortable, the place where your community is, and the place where you feel like you belong. For people in the past, their home was a region of the world that they had grown up in for generations, and it was a place they felt they would always have. Sometimes, though, we get pulled from our home, never to return. The colonization of the Americas remains a story that's often romanticized as being a great achievement in the pursuit of manifest destiny to this day. But the truth of the matter is that in order to achieve that new world, a lot of blood had to be shed. That's because, for those who were already living there when the first European settlers arrived, it wasn't a new world at all. No, it was their home. Unfortunately, though, it wouldn't be theirs for much longer, and in the process of being displaced from it, thousands of them would be killed. The territory now known as California was a far different place prior to the arrival of Spanish settlers in the mid-1700s. At that point, it was a largely peaceful and prosperous region filled with a variety of different indigenous tribes, with the total population reaching somewhere approaching 300,000. Because of that, it meant it was highly diverse and interconnected, with many of those tribes speaking multiple languages and working together closely to create a strong economy of trade. Of course, that would change in 1769 as it was then that both Catholic Spanish missionaries and military forces led by Juanipero Serra and Gaspar de Portola, respectively, first arrived in the area and began attempting to convert the locals to their religion. That meant using means such as baptism, something the indigenous people often had no understanding of. Sadly, though, whether they understood it or not, it didn't change the fact that such a process now put them legally under the physical command of their interlopers, making them prime targets for things like levels of enforced work which came dangerously close to outright slavery. It seemed like there was no real desire from the missionaries to actually help the indigenous people to live better lives through the word of God. Rather, they were exploited for their labor, with them often being punished for any perceived wrongdoings during that process by being beaten, whipped, or even placed in public stockades. And that wasn't the only new problem the locals were having to deal with by then either as, aside from losing many of their human rights, they were also being assaulted with diseases that had been brought over from Europe, diseases they had never encountered before and so had no ability to fight back against. That led to many deaths, with rough estimates suggesting 33% of the population disappeared during the time period, and at least according to one native scholar, George Tinker, as many as 90%. But what could the indigenous people do about it? After all, they had no real means of fighting back. It wasn't as if they could just politely ask their captors to leave their land. So in the end, many took to trying to flee the area altogether, though that often led to them being captured during the attempt and punished even worse after the fact. Still, at least some did manage to get away, almost 4,000 in 1817 alone. That said, it still left the majority forced to remain behind and suffer as in 1821, Mexico formally gained its independence from Spain. Why was this important? Well, at that point in time, California was still part of the Mexican territory and so the people who lived there were now officially under that government's power. Not that this changed much about their situation, however. No, if anything, it only made things worse as the new California governor, Jose Maria de Achindia, immediately set about passing a law which made each of the tribes formal Mexican citizens, a decision that only served to take them a step further away from being fully emancipated once more. As if that wasn't bad enough, the even poorer conditions many of the locals were now living in only increased the ever-growing death toll they were up against. In fact, according to Benjamin Madley in his comprehensive book on the subject, An American Genocide, The United States and the California Indian Catastrophe, 
By then, one in three infants were passing away before their first birthday. And of those who did survive longer than that, a further four in ten died before reaching the age of five. Then there was the adult death toll, with between 10 and 20 percent of fully grown males and females perishing on an annual basis. It wasn't much better for those who had somehow managed to navigate the difficult process of gaining emancipation either, because while they were technically free to go and live their lives as they wished, under any conditions they wished, rampant debt peonage and wage labor meant that they were still effectively living under the same terms of slavery they had been before. But for as bad as that was, it was nothing compared to what was still to come as in 1846 the U.S. gained control of California once more following the end of the Mexican-American War. With the land now firmly back in their hands, it meant many citizens from far out east began traveling across the country in order to find any new opportunities that may be laying there. Of course, what they found when they got there was a native people who were still feeling the brunt of a seemingly never-ending conflict. That year alone, the battle for supremacy between the U.S. and Mexico had seen four separate massacres take place. One along the Sacramento River, another at Sutter Buttes, a third in Palma Valley, and a final one in Temecula. With the combined efforts of these assaults leading to the deaths of over 200 locals. That's right, given they were technically part of the enemy at the time, Americans felt no hesitation when it came to butchering camps full of indigenous tribes. After all, such acts served the dual purpose of not only weakening the opposition overall, but also freeing up the land for later colonization by new settlers. It wasn't as if the natives were seen as real people by many in the military anyway. No, as far as they were concerned, they were little more than subhuman, a lesser form of life that could not be compared to such great white men branching out in order to achieve their manifest destiny. That led to even more massacres taking place as the years went on, including four in 1847 alone at Rancheria Tulia and Sutter's Ford in Alta, California. In 1848, when the California Gold Rush finally took hold of the country, it meant even more space would have to be cleared out in order to accommodate the tens of thousands of Americans who were now heading out west to seek their fortune. Yes, the promise of riches being found out in the hills along the coast was just too enticing of an opportunity for many to pass up. Still, for as much as the pursuit of gold was the original aim of such endeavors, as time went on, the real value of the area became apparent, and that value was the land itself. Why was that? Well, with there being no laws protecting property rights in California at that point in history, it meant those who had come from out east were free to just take whatever they wanted. Hell, such a process was actually sponsored by the U.S. government themselves when they offered to sell that land to American citizens for the sum of $1.25 per acre, with Mexican-American war veterans being entitled to up to 160 acres free of charge. It didn't matter if the indigenous tribes of the area were already living there. No, they just have to accept that things were different now and this was no longer their country. In order to make sure they were aware of that fact, those people who sought to take what was once theirs often had little reservation when it came to killing them in order to do so. Not that the process always involved killing, though. No, sometimes it just involved taking ownership of such people and once again effectively entering them into indentured servitude. That latter route didn't always work out too well, though, because, as everyone knows, a man can only take so much before they finally break. That was what led to another notable massacre in May of 1850 when upwards of 400 Pomo tribes men and women rebelled against their captors, Andrew Kessley and Charles Stone, and in the process were killed by a contingent of 1st Dragoons Regiment of the United States Cavalry. Clearly then, things were going from bad to worse and something had to be done to quell the violence before it got completely out of control. But it wasn't like the state had any intention of stepping in and slowing things down. No, they'd actually make the situation worse when on April 22, 1850, California passed the Act for the Government of Protections of Indians, a piece of legislation which, despite its name, only served to legalize the kidnapping and forced servitude of natives by white settlers if certain conditions were met. That wasn't all they were doing either, because a year after that, Further fuel would be thrown onto the fire of hatred against the indigenous tribes of the area when the civilian governor of the state at the time declared in a now infamous speech, quote, 
that a war of extermination will continue to be waged until the Indian race becomes extinct must be expected. So obviously, that led to an even greater number of massacres taking place as by 1851, additional legislation made it so that settlers from the East now not only had the legal right to organize lynch mobs and commit murder, but also to submit their expenses for doing so to the government. Yes, believe it or not, the state of California had reached the point of formally sponsoring the genocide of any tribes who had previously called the land home with them paying out $11,143 to one man alone, and around $1.5 million in claims overall by the time 1861 rolled around. That created a nightmarish Cormac McCarthy-esque situation where it wasn't uncommon to see natives get raped, hung, or even scalped during those attacks. But for as horrific as those were, and for as many deaths as they led to, None compared to the complete chaos wrought by the series of Round Valley Settler Massacres between 1856 and 1859 specifically. While other incidents had led to a death toll of anywhere between 40 and 450, what took place in Round Valley saw over a thousand indigenous people be murdered. Working on the dime of the government, a group of around 20 to 30 men had made their way over to the location in hopes of setting up a shop and, according to one settler named Dryden Lecoq, once they found people already calling it home, they'd committed a series of attacks over a four-year period, as many as three a week in fact, with each attack yielding a death toll of 50 to 60 men, women, and children. It wasn't just a case of them walking in and butchering them with weapons haphazardly either. No, in a way, that would have been more humane as it would have been quicker. Rather, the methods of murder included more drawn-out and insidious things such as poisoning the locals' food supply without their knowledge and waiting for them to die of subsequent illness. The entire incident was so bad that at one point even the military allegedly stepped in and tried to calm the situation down as they felt things had gone too far, or at least that's according to what Major Edward Johnson stated in January of 1959. In truth, though, it now appears that, while soldiers did arrive on the scene and while they didn't contribute towards the massacre directly, they also didn't make any moves to stop the white settlers from doing what they were doing either. No, they had no reason to as the results were exactly what they wanted from the situation. They also didn't do anything to stop the $9,347.39 being paid out to those same white settlers in claims after the fact just as they didn't offer any kind of recompense to the 500 or so members of the Yuki tribe who were left alive once all was said and done, with that marking only a tenth of what their population had been before. That said, at least some change did come out of the tragedy in the end as, due to the sheer savagery of it and others like it around the same period, in 1860, California State Legislature felt compelled to pass a law that expanded the age and conditions of natives available for forced slavery, making it so that at least children could no longer be legally murdered or forced into indentured servitude. Of course, the decision to do that was probably helped by the fact that the state wasn't the only one who were now starting to feel the moral pangs of what they were allowing. No, the public were also beginning to grow a conscience over the situation too. In fact, an article was even published in the Sacramento Daily Union at the time that directly criticized the campaign of blood as being nothing more than a way for high-powered lobbyists to profit off the enslavement of others. As they put it, when specifically talking about the initial legislation that sponsored the killing spree, quote, The act authorizes as complete a system of slavery without any of the checks and wholesome restraints of slavery as ever was devised. Why such a sudden change in attitude now after all this time? It's hard to say, though it could have been due to the fact America was on the verge of falling into a civil war and so perhaps the idea of someone being murdered on their own doorstep when they'd done nothing to warrant it hit a little closer to home than it had previously. Even if there were growing concerns, what could the people do to change what was happening? Not a lot at their level, it seemed. Luckily for them, though, and luckily for any of the native tribes who were suffering the effects of such brutality, change would be on its way, at least to some degree, as in January of 1863, Abraham Lincoln famously passed his Emancipation Proclamation, an act which outlawed slavery across the country. While such an act did affect the majority, a loophole in it meant slavery and forced labor was able to continue for indigenous people under the name of apprenticeship. Yes, by simply rebranding what they were doing, 
slavers were able to carry on as normal for several more years. That wasn't all they were continuing, as following the Round Valley Massacres, at least a dozen other attacks would take place between 1859 and 1871, with the total death toll from these reaching almost 1,000 people. One of the last of these, in fact, the Kingsley Cave Massacre, ended up leaving only 15 members of the Yahi tribe alive come the close of the attack. And they weren't the only group whose numbers were reduced to almost extinction levels by that point, as pretty much every other native people in the California area had their population cut to a mere fraction of what it had once been. As a whole, the indigenous population saw their numbers go from somewhere around 150,000 to a mere 1,500 by the turn of the century. That's not even getting started on the fact that they also lost their land they called home during that process too, making recovery even more difficult. Needless to say, in recent years there have been a lot of calls for that land to be given back and for full reparations to be made to the descendants of anyone who was affected by the California Genocide. It's certainly a sentiment which has been pushed by Karina Gould, spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashan Ohlone, a tribe who originated in the region that is now the San Francisco Bay Area. In her own words, quote, This is all stolen land. We are landless Indians in our own territory. The only compensation for land is land. Thankfully then, at least some local governments have come to agree with that and have started to return said land back to its original owners. With one of the most notable examples happening in 2015 when officials in Sonoma County agreed to transfer nearly 700 acres to the Cassia Band of Pomo Indians who once called it their home. As if that wasn't enough, in 2019 further progress was made in terms of setting things right when California Governor Gavin Newsom made a formal apology to any natives affected by the crimes of the past, with him then going on to describe the entire thing as a war of extermination which should have never been allowed to happen. But while that is certainly a step in the right direction, for some it's still not anywhere near the level things should be at. No, for them, an apology is all well and good, and some land being given back is great, but far more needs to be done in order to truly set things right once more. What would make things right in their eyes? Well, a good start would be to reassess the way the California genocide is taught to children. That's because, as it stands right now, school curricula tend to gloss over the true depravity of what happened, sanitizing it and lessening its impact in the process. As Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, author of An Indigenous People's History of the United States and a California State University professor emerita put it, land seizures from native tribes should be central to the U.S. history curriculum, and not something told in the form of sugar cube mission model programs which only serve to infantilize it and take all of the terrible detail and nuance away from what occurred. Of course, others have gone even further than that in their belief about what changes should be made, with some arguing the role of Catholic missionaries in the violence and murder of natives should be directly acknowledged in schools. Along with that, any educational establishments named after violent settlers should be changed altogether. Will that ever happen on a widespread scale? It remains to be seen. But at least one school, the University of California Hastings College of Law, has heeded the calls by voting to change their name in November of 2001 on account of S.C. Hastings' role in the killing of the Yuki tribe during the 1850s. So, at least there's hope things will continue on in that vein as the years progress, even if other areas continue to stall. Despite what took place in California during the mid to late 1800s seeming like a clear example of genocide, there remains an ongoing academic debate about whether or not it truly can be considered as such. As historian Jeffrey Ostler described it, the sticking point appears to be disagreements regarding the definition of the term itself. As he put it in his own writings, in fact, under a strict interpretation of genocide, it would require a federal or state government intention to kill all California Indians in an outcome in which the majority of deaths were from direct killing. So, if that's taken to be true, technically what took place back then wouldn't count. That said, there are others who argue under a less strict structuralist definition it does qualify as based on this. The term genocide would require only settler intention to destroy a substantial portion of California Indians using a variety of means ranging from disposition to systematic killing. Whatever side of the argument people fall upon, though, the consensus is the same. And that is whether technically an example of genocide or not, the crimes committed against the indigenous tribes of California were truly unacceptable and should never be forgotten about. 
After all, if we don't remember the past, then we're often doomed to repeat it. And no one in any kind of civilized society should ever want anything like that to happen again. So, for the good of America and for the healing of its indigenous people, it must always be remembered as part of our history. That way, we can all take from it that working to be better isn't always an easy path to go down, and we have to fight hard to make sure we don't stray from it. Thanks for letting us tell you this sinister story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, and hit like, rate it, or leave a comment. Join us next week when we'll take you somewhere sinister.